Now, you're one of the only people I know who actually used a one-time pad. We've all, we'll probably lecture about it. I don't know anybody. Maybe you guys have used one. You've used one, right? Like, tell oh, us how you were, and you were also using this, this very interesting means for writing Notes right. back. Right. Tell so us how that forward. works. It'd probably help to be a chemist uh, uh, to do that. Right? Uh, no, that not really. I thought that was going to be a good but, question. But, but no, but the funny thing is, I'm, my best German friend, uh, we were like, like really, like really close in college. He wound up uh, uh, as, a, as a chemist at the Stasi uh, in the forgery department. He actually forged passports that I, I may have used. Really? <laughs> anyway, a one-time pad. Serendipity, right? Yeah. Right. <clears throat> um, so how did that work? Yeah. Well, first of all, um, the, initially I was trained to, to use a manual algorithm to come up. See, she didn't, the encryption of the messages was, uh, was double. First you translate your letters into digits, and it seems to be an international standard. <laughs> oh, I'm serious. Everywhere you look, there are groups of five. Groups of five, 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 five. Who came up with that? ISO. Paul did. It's, it's, that's the 11th commandment. The 11th commandment handed down to Moses, I think. Thou shalt use only groups of five. Um, so, so, anyway, uh, so, so, so you translate the letters into numbers, and then you have a, a, a separate algorithm which I figured out after a while, this is a way to randomize things and make sure that whatever set of numbers, digits you come out with, there's an equal number of ones, twos, threes, fours, five, and so forth. Um, and I, for the first eight years, I used that. Uh, so then, th then you do some math, either add or subtract, and eventually you come up with a message. Uh, those algorithms, I was told, were good for about 300 uses. and and. Eventually, there was not enough time to teach me another one, so they gave me the one-time pads. Um, they were about the size of this, maybe half. All right, and it was a regular little note, notepad, and I had to. Uh, I think it may have been like this. Uh, develop that with iodine solution, and so the groups of five came up, uh, and the, they had every every. Uh, transmission and I got the the digits uh, through shortwave Morse code. What they used was identical to what I had, and then you throw it away. Right. Next time you use it, right. according to the folks that I've had interaction with in the FBI or as well as in the IT community, that is unbreakable as long as you use it only once. Yeah, and don't uh, lose the pad. <laughs> then it doesn't work. Well, that's a big deal. And, uh, right? and I, I was wondering if that technology cannot eventually be used to make all the other security uh, measures uh, unnecessary. Except, how do you how do you get that pad thing to the other side? That's that's the part. it's the I part, right? The infrastructure part. But you hit on it exactly. One time pad is perfect when you go to RSA. And there's a guy up there with a beard and Birkenstock saying perfect cryptography. You raise your hand and you go, well, you know, as long as you're subject to these things, and those are the things that make it hard. But I tell you, it's, um, it, was, it was such a pain in the neck, to, particularly while I used the manual uh, algorithm. I went to um, my, the, the shortwave transmission, which, by the way, is still used. It's, it's, uh, it's preferable to web-based internet point-to-point -point because you throw it out. Everybody knows that there's a, there's a transmission, but nobody knows who's actually listening to it. And so I would listen to it for like, sometimes for an hour, sometimes for an hour and a half, and then I had to go and, and develop that manual algorithm. And sometimes these, these radio friends were really long. It took two, three hours to get the equivalent of half a page in a book. Really? Pain in the neck. What kind of information going back and forth? A lot of. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me let me see. Um, I didn't get a lot of good instructions from from the center because they really didn't know. Yeah. I was the expert. They gave me a lot of uh, advice and instructions in all wrong, and it, it, at times it was more like the Keystone Cops. 
instead of you know, what you would think was the most powerful security agency, intelligence agency in the history of mankind. It was the CIA, FBI, NSA, whatever else under one roof. But they had no idea how this country functions. And I don't think the Russians today know much better, except for those who have come here and studied here, right, and worked here for a while. But, but so, uh, you know, I sent back some information. I, I, I profiled people. I sent in, uh, information about, you know, the mood of the country, some, some basic uh, stuff that you can't find in the, uh, in the newspaper. And guess it's really odd, but. Uh, once a quarter, I had to submit a detailed finance report. <laughs> it's See, like all of us. Yeah, you, you have expense <laughs> reports too. I did. I you should do it as a one-time pad. That's right. Expense report. How cool would that be? That'd be awesome. That would be part of that Cisco wise. Now, you at some point you decided that this was going to be your home, and tell us about how you <clears> managed. Because everybody, if you haven't read the book. They were probably sitting there thinking, how the hell do you get away from the KGB? Yeah, I resigned. You I, had a pretty interesting I, little I, trick that you I, used. I, I'm surprised you I, put it in the book. I, I, I think uh, I should be in the Guinness Book of World Records. Not only did I resign from the KGB and I got away with it, but I also resigned in secret writing. I wrote him a letter in secret writing. When, wow. when, when, they, when they called me back, I said, I can't come. I have. AIDS. It's 1988. 1988. I have contracted AIDS, and I, to make it credible, I trace it back to an individual, a, a young lady that I told him pre previously that I had, a, a, you know, I had some interaction with, uh, whose ex-boyfriend was a drug, a drug addict. So, and I said, well, you know, the only place where I could possibly get treatment is here. Well, I also knew that in, in those days AIDS was pretty much a death sentence and the Russians were, the Soviets were deathly afraid. So this is the last thing they wanted to have somebody back in their country, uh, somebody with a deadly disease. So they wrote me off as a stranded agent who would be dead in a couple of months. And they told my German family that I died. And they gave me, they gave them the money that, that was saved. It was about sixty thousand dollars of fortune in the East in those days, and in an interesting the twist of um, uh, of how things evolve over time. I had a son in Germany whom I deserted. Uh, he just bought a house about a year ago, <clears throat> and a significant part of that down payment was a KGB money. Now, how is it that they didn't notice that you didn't die in two months? <laughs> they didn't bother to check. Really? All right, and I had phenomenal credibility because when I screwed up, I I admitted it. I was I was very forthright, upfront with them. And the whole one thing when it comes to undercover work, it's based on trust. If there's no trust, if I can't trust them, I won't do it. If they can't trust me, they won't send me. Because what you, if anybody has ever watched The Americans, there's a handler who is sitting here in the United States who's meeting with the agents. No way, does not, never happens. Uh, somebody like me, you know, even, even just checking on me would have been a dangerous to my very existence because the operatives here in the country were known and were watched. So, for instance, I knew for sure that they're not checking on me because I committed two deathly sins in the context of undercover work. I actually married a young lady from South America to make her legal. <laughs> I did. So she needed a husband. She needed a green card. And I had an affair with her. And I said, OK, well, let me try. So yeah, I married her. We went to the INS, we, she got a green card, she became a citizen. The Russians never knew about it. They did not check on me, I knew that. So that's what gave me some certainty that, that this, I'd, I'd be able to get away with it. Not 100%, and you know, it was like, it was about three, four months of, uh, of tension where 
and I would go zigzag to work and make sure that I change time and location so I'm not predictable. Because I know the Russians didn't, uh, in the past, they had a history of not dealing with it kindly. You think 10 or 15 years earlier they'd have been more diligent? Oh, they, they would have come after me. Yeah. For Cause, sure. Because we all know how that story went from 88 to 90. Yeah, in yeah. 91. Uh, so there's some serendipity there, sir. Yes, there was. Yeah, but I didn't know that. So, so I didn't know that, that the wall would come down. What did after. you think when you watched all that? And at that point, and I was a distant observer. I said, wow, interesting. But, you know, that wasn't my country anymore. I was, you know, I was here. I was, I had sort of withdrawn from the international scene. I was going to live my life out as a middle class American, you know, with the American dream, a house in the country, a couple of kids. Uh, and I knew since my passport application failed, uh, I didn't want to get close to the State Department again, so I knew I would, other than Canada in those days, I wouldn't go anyplace else. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't go back to Germany. It was none of my business. I was just, you know, surprised. Now, interestingly enough, well, what, when you talk about making this country a home, it wasn't a home yet. It was sort of a place where I could stay and be and operate. But slowly over time it became a home and the internet had a lot to do with it. My ability to do research. What happened in East Germany? What happened with, uh, with the Soviet Union? And so slowly but surely I understood my, my entire ideological underpinning, which I sort of uh, hadn't gotten rid of. It was socialism at least. Just crumbled under me. Under me. So I, I had to change. I changed completely um, and, and it had a lot to do with my ability to, just to, the, uh, to access information on the web. So two things started to happen around this time, if I've got this right. Your career actually became kind of interesting. You, you became a CIO of an energy company in Princeton. Yep. We have a couple of the folks here today who worked for you before. They don't have to raise your hand, but we'll talk about tearful reunion. <laughs> um, and then also the FBI was on to you right around that time. Right. No, Joe the, me out from you. Yeah, the FBI was. Uh, the but you didn't know. No, no, the FBI found me nine years after I was signed. Uh, and then, that was because there was a defection. Uh, some somebody who worked in the archives uh, at, at the KGB uh, defected and smuggled a whole bunch of material. Uh, had your name? Had my name. And well, they, tell them where the name came from, Jack Barsky. Uh, the, Jack Barsky was a young man who <coughs> who died at the age of ten, and some Russian diplomat found the gravestone uh, in uh, Maryland, just outside of D.C. And that's typically how the Russians stole, uh, the Soviets stole uh, identities. You know, take take somebody who who passed uh, very early, and they get and, and they managed to get the birth certificate. So I became that person. Yep. And so you know, the FBI found me, and literally they they, they took uh, three years to investigate me because they didn't know. They they knew one thing that I was a well-trained agent. I was undercover, I was a well-trained agent, so they had no idea whether I, was I still, you know, was I a sleeper, was I still in operations. And in those days, they had two really, really uh, very damaging cases, uh, in, uh, one in the CIA, one in the FBI, uh, Alder James and uh, Hansen. Robert Hansen, and they were both insiders, they did phenomenal damage, and they were worried that I, uh, I was running one of those guys. Uh, and and uh, it, it, it's sort of in hindsight, it's ridiculous. I was, you know, I was taking care of my family. I was, was commuting uh, one and one and a half hours to my job. I, I had no, you know, my, my I, I forgot that I had ever been uh, an undercover agent. And here I was, the number one case in uh, counterintelligence with the FBI. And they'd actually bought the house next to you. They bought the house next to me. And took up bird watching as a... <laughs> were, were they good neighbors? <laughs> uh, they never introduced themselves. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, you know, to... Using broad, soft phones, maybe. To, yeah. Well, they did bug my house, and that's how I finally uh, wound up. And, you know, I was telling my wife, and there was an altercation, and I... I 
I sort of lifted the kimono a little bit and I said, you know, you know what I sacrificed to be with you guys, blah, blah, blah. That was my secret weapon. The, the nuclear option backfired in two ways. She just got scared uh, uh, and, and the FBI had, had my, my confession on tape. <laughs> just to finish that up, Joe Riley, who was the secret agent, uh, the special agent who, in charge of the operation, is uh, the godfather of my last child. He's retired. Uh, He's retired, right, and we played a lot of golf together. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you talked about the fact that the FBI got on to you. How did you end up not going to jail or something being traded for some other agents? So it seems you, you're a U.S. citizen now with a passport. The FBI is not known for the benevolence, so they how did... They put Martha Stewart in jail. Oh, yeah, they put Martha Stewart in jail, and yeah, you're... You spent no jail time and were well, allowed I, to continue your career. I had currency. I had knowledge that they wanted. Okay. And, and you know, you, you're right. I'm, I'm not sure that they just wanted to be nice to me. However, I be, became really friends with a guy who, uh, who worked my case. Uh, but ultimately, you know, if I have nothing to give him, I'm, you know, but, but what's the use of putting me in jail? Because the Russians wouldn't have wanted me back. The Germans may have, so it, I wasn't much of a, a bargaining chip, and putting me in jail would have just added, uh, uh, you know, to to the budget, to the federal budget, you know. I'll oh, see. Okay. <laughs> so, so it was a rational thing to do. Now, I, I give you a much better example, um, where somebody who is now a U.S. citizen uh, had done some significant damage to the United States, much more than I did. Uh, there's a fellow named o Oleg Kalugin. I met him uh, a couple of times. He was the head of counterintelligence at the KGB. That guy signed death sentences. He, he chased down people like me in his time. He's a U.S. citizen. He came over here because he got into a, a fight with uh, Putin. Putin wanted to put him in jail. He, he hightailed it out of here, and, 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 and even though he did a lot of damage, uh, the United States government allowed him to operate here, and he's now a proud, proud citizen. So this is how it works in this world, right? Uh, if you have something to give, they'll be nice to you. <laughs> yeah, so... So you trained for a number of years uh, before? Yes, and, 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 and because of the many years, of, the training, by the way, was all one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, there were probably no more than three, four people who knew my real identity. And every time I, I had one-on-one -on -one training with, with a specialist, such as Morse code, uh, encryption, and all that stuff, uh, they would introduce themselves by name, and I would, get a, I would introduce myself with a different name. And you know when they introduced themselves, that was not that name, but that was a given. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and, and I came here in 78, really well trained and, uh, and probably well equipped because um, I'm not as smart as my, the predecessor in this chair. I know this. Yeah, and, none and, of us are either. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and I have a lot of respect for some of the smart people I, I work with in IT. Like for instance, uh, I had the opportunity to work with a couple of guys who did AI, real AI, neural network based AI in the 90s. Right, and like, wow, I could barely understand what they were doing. But anyway, I have uh, what God gave me, sort of is a lot of common sense. My wife has managed to turn this into, you got common nonsense. <laughs> but, but, you know, and that allowed me to, to, like, find my way in the U.S. I came here pretending to have been born here. Uh, and, and I succeeded. I fooled, fundamentally, the whole country. Uh, and you can only do that in New York City, by the way, um, <laughs> because there, there is no crazy person that doesn't exist in another version in New York, right? So I, if I come here and I have a little bit of an accent, and, yeah, that's all explainable. There's a zillion accents in New York. If they had uh, shipped me into Chicago, I probably would have failed. You came with a birth certificate. I did. <clears throat> As I recall, the first... Um Cascading or federation of that was for a was it a library card? 
Yeah, it's a it's a long story. It was I was I was supposed to take that birth certificate and parlay this into a full set of American uh, uh, authentic documentation. Passport being the holy. Passport grail. was the holy grail. The whole idea was uh, to uh, once I got a passport, I was going to go back to Europe. They were going to set me up with a thriving business, and they knew how to do that. Funnel a lot of money into that business, come back into the U.S., and at that point. I am uh, I'm in, a, in a situation in society where I have open access to, well, doors open, right? I can join a country club, I, I can meet people, you know, who are of interest. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> that didn't work, but, you know, I did, I did manage to get uh, my library card and uh, uh, driver's license and a social security card. So I was able to function and operate. The when, Social Security card's an interesting story, right? You said you were working off in a farm somewhere? <laughs> yeah. State. Well, in those days, uh, there were some uh, sections of the working population that were still exempt from the Social Security uh, Administration. Uh, uh, employees of, um, uh, of clergy, of churches, and so forth, and farm workers. So I, when I went for the interview, According to my birth certificate, I was 35 years old. And they asked me, so how come you don't have a social security card? I, said, I didn't need one. And I, I, I kept the answers very short. Uh, how come not? Did you ever work? Yes, I did. OK, so what did you do? Well, I worked on a farm. So I had myself uh, um, sort of like. It was approved immediately, right? Yes, it was. Farm, <clears throat> got it. Yeah, but I also managed to dumb down to, uh, to a point where it was credible. You know, I. I, I walked in with dirty fingernails, uh, not shaven, my hair not washed, and I, and, and I had wiped uh, my, my, my eyes with a lot of soap until they were burning so hard, uh, but they were red. Okay, so, so I literally walked in there like a country Mark market. does that before he briefs the board. Absolutely, every time. <laughs> Gives you more credibility. Yes, you sure does. <laughs> And I like your comment of keeping it simple and don't, don't talk too much. Oh, you're so, you're so right about it. And <clears throat> once, this is one of my, my downfalls uh, and, and, and during my corporate career. I didn't know when to shut up. You know, instead of keeping it short, I would just give people a lengthy explanation. And I was mostly, you know, this is the opiate that you hang yourself with as an IT guy. <laughs> okay. Now, so. Um, so once you had a driver's license, right. um, this was in the late 70s, early 80s. So uh, 79. 79, mm -hmm. 80 or so. What could you do at that point? Like, what, as a, like Nothing, because, uh, because I, had, you know, I couldn't take my credentials with, with me. Uh, and as I said, I had, a, I had a master's in chemistry that had become useless. So I had no work history. Mm -hmm. So I started working as a bike messenger. Nobody asked a question of a, somebody who says, you know, can you, the only question was, can you ride a bike? I said, sure. And so that was crazy. You, you got hurt when you got into the hospital. Were there some issues with who you were and how the no, medical bills paid? And that sort well, <laughs> in those days, you could actually pay your medical bills, and I paid cash. The Russians gave me enough money to handle that, but like I had a shoulder injury, I went to Cabrini, uh, the emergency room, and they treated me. I paid them. It was really affordable. Mm, a little different. <laughs> the, the one thing I was worried about in those days, too, if I ever had to get operated on, I would, would uh, yeah. be under. And I was worried about saying something in German. Right, right, right. So I avoided the operation. That shoulder is still dislocated. Is it really? Yeah. Wow. Tell us about your um, your work career after the um, you know as you became CIO. You, you and I were well, chatting. Well, I wasn't. I was good at it. I was a really really good programmer. I uh, you know I stretched COBOL to its absolute limits <laughs> uh, because they wouldn't give me in those days. I wasn't a systems programmer. I was applications. I wouldn't have access to assembler even though I knew assembler, but I couldn't get to it. So and and, and I wrote some phenomenal code. Uh, I, I don't want to brag about it, but... but uh, you just did. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I could go further. That's okay. And, uh, explain to people what that we're, code did. We're everybody in here, Brad. That's but, why we're here. But, go but, ahead. But, <laughs> well, we, 
we had this one time we, where MetLife was splitting data centers. And in those days, it was all on mainframe and, uh, you know, uh, uh, file storage and, and job control language and libraries. And I wrote a program. And we had, there was a system that had uh, well, about a thousand user written programs in batch and about a thousand in CICS and, and, and associated files and everything. I wrote a program that analyzed everything that went there and translated it into everything that went over there. That's cool. And uh, I had about three months to get that done. And I decided not to try it manually. I wrote a program. I had faith. Yeah. You're a smart guy. You're the uh, valedictorian. Oh, yeah, that was another uh, mistake I made. Right. <laughs> a, Your grades a, were too good, and suddenly you became yeah, the valedictorian. Yeah, that, that, was, that was one of my, my, my uh, you know, I wasn't, the, the cultural knowledge of another country is something that you take a long time to, uh, to acquire. And so when I aced college, I was surprised that when, when the dean called me and says, you've got to give a speech, I said, what? Yeah, uh, you're the valedictorian. I said, what? <laughs> I couldn't get out of that one. It's kind of ironic. So I, there was, a, at the time, I was an active KGB agent giving the valedictory at a, at a United States business school. <laughs> See, my, my life is more of a comedy than, than an adventure. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, so yeah, I'm, you know, I, I have reasonable Talk about the tough. job at running IT, running the, that's So, so uh, one day, my my the, the guy who was my manager quit, and he dumped a bunch of uh, Gardner reports on my desk, and he said, "You're next." You're it. I said, "Are you crazy?" So I slowly worked my way into management, and you know, I climbed up the ladder. And this is, I got a quote. This is you guys gonna love it. <laughs> present company excluded, <laughs> but uh, this friend of mine who, who made it up the ladder in the Stasi, in the East German Intelligence, just gave a radio interview. And one of the quotes which this he gave was just phenomenally insightful. It is part of the human condition. He said, I noticed the higher I climbed up the ladder, the more stupid people I found. <laughs> and he said that, right? Right. But anyway, I ran into that problem all the time, so that's why, you know, I, I never lasted more, uh, five years. I never had a five-year anniversary at any one company. It, I, I just, you know, I didn't learn to uh, communicate, quote-unquote, the truth with, uh, you know, with a, a soft wrapper. You know, I was still the old German. Germans are very direct and in your face, and you know, they give you an opinion whether, whether you ask for it or not, and they're this close to you. And it took me a long time to figure out that, that I was still acting like a German. I still have that residue in me, but it's not as strong as it used to be. I, had, I got married to a Jamaican, and she took the edge off in a big way. <laughs> you might have, uh, you might have so been I a good guy. CIO, yeah. You might have been a good guy for Google. That might have fit in pretty well over there. Like I think the Google the people are too smart for me. That direct approach. So interesting. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I worked in, in five different companies, uh, in three different uh, industries, and I never found a well-functioning large organization, only pockets within the organization. And, and sometimes those pockets were so good that, uh, that uh, the senior management saw them as a threat and disbanded the folks. <laughs>